Good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to see you today, and we thank you so much for joining us for Epic Adventures in Fantasy Illustration, a symposium organized by the Norman Rockwell Museum's Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies. Last evening, Jesse Kowalski, curator of our recently opened exhibition, Enchanted, A History of Fantasy Illustration, offered an in-depth look at the history and primary themes explored in fantasy art across time. But if you didn't get a chance to see it and would like to, I'm happy to report that his outstanding presentation will be available on YouTube in the coming days. We have an exciting series of talks to share today, so I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown of what's coming up. In just a few minutes, Sarah Frazetta, granddaughter of legendary uh, fantasy artist Frank Frazetta, will offer opening remarks and welcome Sarah, we're really happy to have you. Following his death in 2010, Sarah and her mother, Holly Frazetta, formed the company Frazetta Girls. And Sarah has been overseeing her grandfather's legacy by sharing and promoting his life's work. And uh, she's actually preparing to open a museum of Frank's art uh, in Florida. So more on that soon in our upcoming conversation with Sarah and Jesse. The Frazetta Legacy in Contemporary Fantasy Illustration of Family Artists will feature Julie Bell, Boris Vallejo, Anthony Palumbo, and David Palumbo. And that panel is scheduled from about 10.45 to 11.45. And from about noon to 1 p.m., we'll explore the epic fantasy adventure with illustrators Alessandra Pisano, Donato Giancola, and Gregory Manches. Throughout this entire program, if you have questions or comments, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Many thanks to my colleagues, Rich Bradway and Alyssa Stubel who are working behind the scenes to make this event possible. And we will all be happy to share your comments and questions and thoughts. Enjoy the program and thank you again for joining us. Uh, welcome Sarah and Jesse. It's wonderful to be here. Good morning. Hey Sarah, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you doing? Great, great. Uh, it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, Only a week ago. <laughs> yeah, so you were at the opening of the Enchanted exhibit last week and uh, you saw uh, a lot of artists and uh, some of your grandfather's work. Uh, had you seen any work that you, you hadn't seen in person before? Oh, most of them I hadn't seen before. Um, I, I was really blown away by Julie Bell's work. Um, I've never seen one of her originals in person and it, it, was, it, was, it was stunning. Um, but it was a real treat to be there. I met a lot of the artists and um, all of you and your colleagues were just just a class act. I mean, the exhibit is gorgeous and it was an, it's an honor to be involved and um, to have you have me write the forward. So um, I'm really thankful to be here and uh, to have been there. Okay, yeah, I just uh, I wanted to ask uh, about your grandfather. Yeah, you wrote uh, in the forward, you wrote about uh, a lot of memories you have uh, spending time with him. Uh, any specific events you recall? And I guess, uh, what was he like in person? You know, it's, it's so funny how memories can remain dormant and then something triggers you and you, you remember it again. Um, recently, I was thinking about, I mean, I can remember from being three or four years old and um, we would take walks on the property. Um, he had a 67 acre estate in Pennsylvania. That's where I was born and grew up um, until I was six years old. But we would walk around the property and I had like my little pull wagon full of my stuffed animals and my pull, my wind up toys. And he just really, he really paid attention to me. He really, he, he listened to me ramble. He would just, you know, say how cute I was the whole time. Um, and, and he just, he, aside from just seeing me, he really loved me. So those are like, those are really early memories that are still really vivid. Um, most people can't remember like being three or four years old, but that's that's how special he was that I, I can remember those times. <laughs> yeah, terrific uh, photo of you here with your grandfather. Yeah, that that's my that's honestly one of my favorite photos. Um, I think it's a it's a very telling photo of what's to come. Mm -hmm. um, I know I I never had the slightest clue that this would be my future. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll obviously I'll get to that more in detail in a little bit, but. Um, it, that, that photograph really shows like how much of a, a family man that he really was at that time of his life. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's, it's been asked before, like, was Frank Frazetta a family man? It's been told that he was a true family man, but I think that's like very subjective. Um, mm-hmm. Like I wanted to answer it kind of like from an open-minded point of view because, you know, he's, he's my grandfather. So of course to me, he's a family man, but um, you know, every individual has a unique path of evolution. And I think like our circumstances that we're faced with change us. And I think we have a lot of different versions throughout our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, the photo there with Frank and Ellie, I would say he was not a family man at that time. Um, he, you know, when, when, when Frank was early, um, in his early career, when he was um, a child, when he was a teenager, it was really about Frank. Um, he, he was involved with his family, but he was more interested in pursuing a career, being successful at either professional baseball or art or whatever could make him successful. He always knew inherently he was special and he had something that could take him to that next level. Um, so he spent a lot of the time building himself, building his career. Um, he spends a lot of time with his friends, um, his artist friends, his group of friends with Al Williamson, uh, Roy Krenkel, Angelo Torres, um, Nick Megalin was his, one of his great friends. And then he spends a lot of times with his buddies um, from the baseball. And then he also spent a lot of time dating um, it's actually, my, my grandfather was 28 years old in that photo, and, and, and back in the 50s, that was a little bit older, considered older mm-hmm. to settle down when you were 28 years old. Um, so that was his like first really romantic relationship where he committed to someone else. Um, of course, um, when his children were, were born, his, his priorities changed a little bit, um, his life changed but art was still number one. That was still his number one priority. So I wouldn't still consider him like a family man. Sure, he, he played with his kids. He, was, he, he had his kids in, mind, his be- in their best interest in his mind because he was living in Brooklyn at the time. He wanted to bring them to the country and have them experience a childhood like his childhood. So mm-hmm. he, he was a good father. Um, not a great father, not a perfect father, but, um, but he was, a, he was a good father. He was a loving one and his, and his children remember him in a very positive light. But, but I, I look at him as like a, a family man when he, when that table turned, when, when, when the, when the chapter turned and he became a grandfather because of the circumstances in his life. I mean, he went through severe illnesses, which a lot of people know about. Um, he had an undiagnosed thyroid issue and in, in, started in his fifties. So, um, you know, he really lost a lot of his, his motor functions and a lot of his life. So at that, at that stage, when he was a grandfather, it was like, you know, we, we became his like true joy and, and we became the people he could feel comfortable around and we, he knew we wouldn't judge him. So he could have that side of him that was childlike and, um, you know, it was kind of like a full circle moment for him. So so that's that's how I would summarize the the, the fa- him being a family man. Yeah. Now he's pictured here with his wife Ellie. She was a model in some of his works, and later yes. on she uh, kind of managed his career, right? Yeah, yeah. My grandmother was a strong woman, and that was the reason why he liked her. I mean, she, he said from the minute he met her, she was witty, and she just you know kept him on his toes the whole time. So. And, and, he, and he really liked that she had like a very muscular body. Um, she was really athletic. She wanted to play with the boys. Um, she, you know, I, I've, I've heard this so many times that it's, it's, it's funny to me, but she would actually have, when the fans would come over, she would challenge them to arm wrestling competitions. And, and I've heard a, a couple of fans, they're older now, and they're like, you know, and, you're, and Ellie was really strong. It was really shocking. I mean, my grandmother was like not five foot one, very petite and like, you know, just blonde, cute, but she had a lot of strength. So, so yeah, um, he, he really, he really fell madly in love with her. Um, their relationship by no means was easy. They fought a lot. Um, from my own memories, I, I can remember the, um, the tension with them, but of course it was always balanced with some kind of humor. Um, and then, yeah, she, she really, she really wanted to keep propelling my grandpa's career because she believed in him. She was his number one fan yeah. and she, she helped him build the merchandising aspect of his and a commercialization of his art. Terrific. And let's see, here's a photograph of uh, mm. Frank with the baseball glove. Tell me a little bit about, he was, uh, he was almost recruited into the major leagues. Yeah. So, yep, that is he, so he, he spent, I'd say more time playing sports than, than he did um, in his art. Uh, Sports were 
everything to Frank. And um, he, he really always said it was because of his true competitive nature. Um, so when he was out there and he could just like show his power, I mean, that was, that was when he was in, that was when he was in his zone. So mm -hmm. he, he, he decided not to go with baseball because I mean, back, back in that time, they were not paid very well. Um, the lifestyle was less than glamorous and he, he didn't, he, did, I think at the time he had to go down to Texas and he was like, no, I'm staying in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like the deciding factor. He was like, what kind of quality of life do I want? Um, it wasn't really like, what do I love more? It was just about like seeing the future. And I think at that time, like wanting to, you know, settle down up in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to run through some of his earlier work here. Uh, some of his comic book work here, Tim Holt, early piece. Yeah, that's a great piece. I mean, and that it, so much of his, like his thunder, I mean, this is when this is when he really labored in his career. Mm -hmm. um, the 60s, 70s, 80s, he you know he he would take what he what he wanted as as far as jobs go. Um, but but in this period of his of his career, he was he was laboring so so much. I mean he he had he worked with Al Cap for seven years, and it was the amount of work that he put out was really incredible mm -hmm. and i you know I, I i hear a lot of the times that he just was born gifted and and sure he was he was he was great even as an eight-year-old child he blew his art teacher away but you have to look at this part of his career and see how much went into making him a great artist mm -hmm. work. yeah this and this, this piece here weird fantasies in the exhibition uh Beautiful. Uh, yeah, terrific uh, collaboration with Al, Al Williamson. Yep, yep. And that was very normal in the beginning of his career to collaborate mm -hmm. with his friends. He loved doing that. Um, I think he missed that in, in when he when he moved out to the country into Pennsylvania um, and he didn't have his circle of friends. I think he really missed those those formative years of of collaboration. And well, he, he really loved this piece. And this piece has been getting a lot of attention lately. It was just published also on the newest uh, Toshin book for EC Comics. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Now it's at, now it's at the Norman Rockwell Museum. Yeah. Incredible. Here's Frank in 1962, self-portrait. Yep. Gorgeous. And uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about this. This was kind of his big break here, right? Yeah, this was his big break. Um, this is when people started noticing his talent and he started getting a lot of movie poster jobs and and he my grandma was very pleased. She was like, well, you bring it in the money now, Frank. Good job. Um, so this was on the on the back cover of Mad Magazine. Right? Yep. 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 Great. <laughs> he so, could really do anything. He was very diverse. <laughs> As you mentioned, he got into doing uh, some movie posters for uh, some uh, Hollywood productions. Um, yeah, the gauntlet, Clint Eastwood. But you mm -hmm. know, it's funny, he he always he he would do like a series of rough works and um he'd probably do like three or four. And he said that they would always pick his least favorite. <laughs> and he was so so he he liked doing that work, but it was also constricted in a way too. I mean, at, eventually he got to a certain point in his career where you know, they, the um, publishers would just take whatever he drew, even if it wasn't relevant to um, the actual contents of the book, yeah. which is unheard of. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, around the time he was doing work like this, he began doing uh, things like this, Conan the Barbarian. Yeah, his Lancer covers were, uh, I would say, the, the the breaking point with like his mile, he hit a milestone with those. Mm -hmm. um, he... Uh, you know, going back to his sports and his love for sports and him being such like an active, like uh, just competitive, strong person. I, I, th I think that's like what we can really see in in these Conan pieces is it's a little bit of Frank inside of them. And, um, you know, he, he was just he was really proud of this work. This was one of his I mean, the, even the composition, he has the, the triangle composition, but the but the background, I mean, you could you could sit there and, and study it for for I don't hours. It's it's really incredible. And I, as much as I look at this artwork day in and day out, there are still little elements that I'll find and go, oh wow, I didn't see that. Like little faces. So mm -hmm. so this it's just it's really incredible. And I mean, it's the legend goes that he sold these books because of his covers. So he he mm -hmm. he Robert E. Howard was such an incredible writer 
And then when the two paired together, it just it, it changed everything as we know it. Yeah. So in my talk uh, last night uh, about the exhibition, um, I referenced uh, including a couple of anti-heroes. Hellboy was one, Vampirella was the other. And uh, I really wanted to include Vampirella in the image or in the, in the exhibit. Um, even though, uh, you know, she's often pictured wearing very little clothing. I did, I was able to find a photograph of her that was, was age appropriate, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, Frank did the, the cover of the very first Vampirella magazine. Yes, and then when he got her back, he actually undressed her. <laughs> 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 In typical Frazetta fashion. Um, he, he loved Vampirella. He thought that the character was um, just, incredible mm -hmm. um there was there was a um a myth that he designed the the costume and i i'm kind of angry at myself that i don't remember her name but he did not design the costume um in fact he was kind of he was kind of confused with the costume and i think that's mm -hmm. why he why he took it off ultimately when he got his original bag <laughs> and uh then uh, the egyptian queen i believe this sold at auction a couple of years ago for something like five million dollars. Uh, do you think, uh, I, I know he wasn't making a lot of money when he was working, but do you think he would be surprised by uh, reaching the five million dollar mark for one of his works? I think my grandpa, if I'm speaking completely honestly, would want it to have been um, even higher. Um, he, most people don't know this, but my grandfather actually sold Conan the Destroyer in 2009 and he earned a million dollars. So it's not that far off, and especially when you like think of inflation. Um, mm -hmm. So, so he sold that for a million dollars, and he was beside himself proud. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. my grandfather. This is true. He was not materialistic. He was a very frugal man. I think that like could be attested because of his humble beginnings. Um, he did have to work really hard to to make what he made, um, and and he he just couldn't believe that he hit that that mark like a million dollars and and yeah. for him it was just again it was just about about um being revered and being seen so i think with egyptian queen yeah he would have been just as happy as when <laughs> when the, when the Conan and the destroyer hit a million dollars <laughs> <laughs> and uh i believe sometimes he he uh, would change paintings a little bit later on or would would adjust things and i believe on this one he changed the the face of her he sure? did. He he did not like the face. It was, I believe, mm -hmm. on Eerie. Um, yeah. And then when when he received the painting back, um, he he actually made note. He he made comments in a couple of interviews, and he talked to me about this. But he said her face. It just it didn't really it didn't pair with the narrative of the story that he was trying to tell. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't want her to look like she was out of control. And in, in the first cover, she looked afraid and like, you know, she needed to yeah. say like a, a hero, but he, she, she was a heroine. She is, uh, she doesn't need a hero. She's okay. Yeah. And if that, if that Panther breaks where well, he already broke the chain, if he starts coming up at her, mm -hmm. she can handle it. And so he wanted her to have like a cool, calm, collective face. And I mean, I'm, I, I liked the first face, but that doesn't even kind of compare to the final version. Mm -hmm. All right, and then um, let's see here. Yeah, uh, the next painting here, this is uh, also in the exhibition uh, from the paperback book cover for uh, Escape from, uh, from Venus uh, by Edgar Rice Burroughs. But uh, uh, a lot of the criticism that fantasy art gets is the portrayal of women. And I was wondering if you wanted to comment on the, the way that uh, Frank portrayed women in his artwork. Um, if they were portrayed uh, gratuitously or if they were portrayed uh, you know as, as strong women what are your thoughts i honestly don't hear that very often i've heard it before um it's just uncommon but i would say you have to look at his art again um you'll if, if you really look at his art if you really know the catalog of frank frazetta then you'll see that his men are depicted in the exact same light i mean mm -hmm. they're his men are attractive they're scantily clad and they're heroes um sometimes they're in distress depending on what beast or monster they're fighting and, and then sometimes they're heroic and they're battling and you know slaying the the giant lizard so I, I i think that anyone anyone to comment that just doesn't really know for zeta mm -hmm. um, great piece uh let's talk about this one 
That is <laughs> death dealer. Number one, death dealer. Number one is, is by far his most iconic painting. Mm -hmm. um, he said, so his fans say, so um, he, he created this character with the intention to bring it to, to comics, a, mo a movie franchise. That's what he always hoped. So he wanted, he wanted death dealer to become like, you know, Darth Vader uh, mm -hmm. for Zeta's Darth Vader in, the, in a way. So that was, that was his, his character and he he really he really loved all of his death dealer paintings i'd say equally um but he was disappointed that nothing ever really became um from the comics and from you know the 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 promises that people would come to the family with mm -hmm. um and and you know that's that's what we're going to do because i want to any anything that was left undone or unfinished business that's that's where frazetta girls comes in and that's where we want to propel it and I mean, Death Dealer is incredible. He's been swiped so many times in Hollywood. <laughs> um, we hear it all the time, and you know, I I just look at it as it's it's flattery. I mean, no no ori no idea is truly original. We all mm -hmm. copy each other. We're all plagiarizing God, nature. So uh, so I I, I think that um, this this album, I mean, or this 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 cover, it was on the Molly Hatchet album. Um, cover and it was it, so people like know that it's iconic from being on an iconic album cover. They they've seen it in Fort Hood, Texas. So there's a lot of symbolism with it too. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of layers to this piece of art. And I was wondering if you could talk about uh, some of his influences because his horses always remind me of uh, if Frank Scuno with horses. Uh, the look on their face, the eyes. You know, the horses are always a little bewildered. Like, you know, what am I doing here? Uh, so, so what were some of Frank's influences? So a combination of his favorites, um, favorite artists and influences are uh, J. Allen, Allen St. John, Howard Pyle, Joseph Clement Cole, um, one of the best anchors of all time, Graham's, Graham Engels, um, Hal Foster, and then of course Norman Rockwell. Um, Norman Rockwell was actually the only artist he and I ever discussed, um, which is why this whole exhibit and me being involved was like so serendipitous but he he actually had a few of his books and he'd pull them off the shelf and when we were sitting on the couch and he would open it and go now this guy this guy could paint this Norman <laughs> Rockwell he was a real artist so you know there were there were a few artists that he would he would talk about but of course like over the years I've heard of his early influences and um uh, it was it was really incredible to see like Hal Foster at the exhibit and and Joseph Clement Cole like you could when you go up and to his original you can see where where my grandfather learned his inking from I mean mm -hmm. it's like the the cross hatching and the the whole it, it's just really incredible and the, for them to all be in the same under the same roof that's just Thank you, Jesse. Thank you and your team. It's just, it's really incredible. Yeah. We need to all be bowing to you. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, so I just wanted to run through a few more paperback uh, covers that uh, that he had done. Uh, this one's underrated. That the, that one, one, flashing flashing swords, uh, number four, yeah. I believe, but um, warrior ball and chain. Mm -hmm. That that one, I mean, if if you can put power into one painting, I'd say mm -hmm. that's it. I mean, and and notice with a lot of them, if as you're scrolling through, you can see the theme, the hand. Do you notice like the hand in a, lo a lot of the presented mm -hmm. pieces? It's it. <laughs> I, I wish you were here so I could just ask him, Grandpa, what's up with the hand? What's the, I think it's just a, a symbolism of like, you know, conquered, being conquered and trying to get, you know, out of whatever mess he's in under there. But um, that piece is, uh, it, it is a masterpiece and it's very underrated. Terrific, yeah. Um, another one here. Uh, I believe this is at the Earth's core. Yep. And then I want yes. us to talk a little bit about uh, celebrity and Frank uh, Frazetta because uh, I know George Lucas after Star Wars came out, George Lucas invited Frank Frazetta out to uh, to his uh, Skywalker Ranch. And what was what was Frank's response? Uh, he he was happy to meet George Lucas. Um, you know they they I don't know if they had a lot in common, but George was a, a very big fan of Frazetta's, and my but grandpa Frank, was very. But Frank didn't go there. No, he didn't. He no. <laughs> George, George came to him, um, <laughs> as did Clint Eastwood. Um, yeah. And my grandfather, I think, he he really liked Clint. 
Yeah. Um, and I think that's just because they had a, a lot of similarities and they were both kind of very, very similar men in, in ways. Um, so they, they could talk to each other on like a personal level. Um, a lot of people that met my grandpa know that he didn't, he wasn't, he didn't really want to sit down and talk about like his technique or the composition of his art or why he did certain things. He would much rather talk about his cameras or, um, you know, sports <laughs> mm -hmm. or, or just pretty much cameras and sports. <laughs> um, if you talk to him about that, you could be his best friend. Mm -hmm. um, but he, you know, he, he would go into it. He would, he would talk about his art from time to time, but it, he mostly just, he really loved when people would come over and just gush over him. He felt yeah. loved and, and special. Terrific. Yeah, and he was asked to do a poster for Clint Eastwood for his movie, The Gauntlet. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, the way uh, Frank used uh, his medium, uh, the way his process was for painting? So most of his paintings were completed within like a week. Um, mm -hmm. He did do a few paintings in a night, um, but yeah, I, th I think it was two nights because of the drawing process. And it seems exactly like the more I, the more I learn about art, the more I know that that's kind of impossible. Mm -hmm. um, he, but he would um, use a lot of turpentine. Um, he would obviously start with his rough works and most of his rough works were accomplished with watercolor. Um, and then he would, he would just have whatever, he was very, like I said, frugal. So honestly, he would kind of take whatever he had in the house, what if it was a canvas board or a piece of masonite, um, but it was usually rather cheap materials. And he would just put that paint on. I mean, he said most of his work, he said that he would just, he would understand like what he wanted to feel from the art first, whether it was warm or cold, and that would, that would be accomplished in his rough work. Um, and then from there, when he would when he would have the layout done on the canvas, um, he would he would just start applying the coats and kind of go by like again how he like feels. It was like he compared it to like composing music um, mm -hmm. when he would lay his when he would lay his colors onto the canvas. Then he would varnish. <laughs> and I think it's funny because uh, in this image, it's clearly Clint Eastwood's head, but it looks like Frank's body. He posed actually for this one. We found <laughs> we found we found a reference photo. Um, you know that's that's another myth that uh, in his later years, um, he, my grandfather said that he would never he never used photo references. Mm -hmm. um, he said it was all by by his photographic memory. But as the internet keeps exposing things, <laughs> that wasn't true. So um, I actually I, I received a bunch of old slides from my uncle Billy. And we found that exact pose. And I, I, I think my grandmother must have taken the picture. So yes, you are, you are right. That is Frank's body. <laughs> <laughs> and then he worked on a film in the early 80s, Fire on Ice with uh, Ralph Bakshi. He, he loved that. I mean, Fire and Ice, we, we would watch Fire and Ice as much as we watched Painting with Fire, his, his documentary. <laughs> but he was so proud of Fire and Ice. And I think um, he really held on to the process of making the film. Um, he always wanted to move out to California, and this was an opportunity for him to be in California for a while, working with Ralph Bakshi. He had a blast. I mean, I don't know what those boys were doing on set. They were, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> they, they, they together. They were quite a pair. Um, but you know, they 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 were able to cast Tigra, um, do all of the rotoscoping. Um, he was he was actually working with James Gurney, who mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of, and James Gurney's in the exhibit. And James Gurney did uh, with Thomas Kincaid did all these backgrounds, which mm -hmm. in my opinion really made the movie. I mean, if you if you look at the movie from an aesthetic point of view, the backgrounds are truly truly incredible. And I think James Gurney, I think he was like 19 years old at the time. Like this was one of his first jobs, but like that, that work on Fire and Ice was very telling of, of how he would become a great himself. I mean, he's just, his, his work, especially in person, I'm just like, oh my God, like he would do kind of the similar things like my grandfather, very work, very, very small and, but so refined and detailed and it, it, it just, it really blows my mind. So, so yes, Fire Dice, that was a great time for him. Um, he said the rotoscoping process was, was time consuming and stressful, 
Um, but he, but he did want to go back into Hollywood again. He mm -hmm. said that he would um, do, he'd like to do something along the lines of like an old, like classic horror film, um, something inspired from his artwork, um, very stylistic to the old Frankenstein, Dracula movies. But unfortunately, in the in the late eighties, is that, that's when he started his health started declining, and he wasn't able to pursue any of those goals. Yeah. And uh, I've had a couple uh, people write in about uh, his relationship with Roy Krenkel. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Without Roy Krenkel, there might not have been a Frank Frazetta as we know him. That's, that is how important Roy Krenkel is mm -hmm. to the legacy of Frank Frazetta. Um, Roy Krenkel pushed my grandfather. He was, my grandpa was lazy in ways. Like he, he was not a lazy person, but he could be lazy in, in some areas. Um, you know, when he felt defeat, he would step back and maybe not go into something um, as quickly as he should have. But Roy was that person that pushed him. Um, Roy was actually working with Edgar Rice Burroughs, and he was a little in over his head with workload. And he, in my grand, at this time, my grandfather just left El Cap, El Cap after seven years, and he was in between work. He was feeling like, you know, maybe I'm just going to give up on this whole art and move on and do something else. And Roy was like, Frank, let me let me get you into let's move you on from inks and into oils, and let's get you let's like really propel this. So he brought him in and had my grandfather doing some of his extra work. And then eventually Ace, they recognized Frazetta and they were like, oh, he's good. We'll keep him on and keep giving him some covers. So that was, I mean, Roy Crankle even, I, I just learned this not that long ago, but one of the uh, Dracula versus Wolfman cover, the, the um, creepy covers, Dracula versus Wolfman, Roy actually did the pre prelim for it, the rough work. And um, there were a few others like, like that as well, where Roy came up with the concept and then my grandpa would paint it. So that that that's really cool to me that they could collaborate like that and and I and Roy was definitely the only person that my grandfather ever said was like his true friend. Yeah. Let's talk about this, Frazetta girls. <laughs> so shortly after your grandfather died, I believe you and your mother Holly started this company, and you've kind of carried on his legacy by uh, licensing his materials. You have a huge social media presence. Uh, uh, could you describe uh, how things are going? Yeah, so a little backstory, um, you know, soon before Frazetta Girls started, I knew grandma and grandpa as grandma and grandpa. That's it. My grandma and grandpa kept business out of family. And in my opinion, I think that was a good choice. Mm -hmm. um, so I, at this, at, after my grandfather passed away in 2010, um, it was like a very tragic time for the family. There was a lot of inner fighting going on. I was finishing up my last year in college and I got a job as a post uh, production coordinator at a post production studio. So I was doing like voice ca voiceover casting, and um, you know I started kind of like dab, like just kind of like getting into more of like a creative pursuit. Um, and ultimately, the nine to six didn't work for my personality. I'm a little too much, so mm -hmm. I, I I ended up leaving and um, pursuing acting. And I started like a personal concierge business to actually pay bills because acting was definitely not paying bills. <laughs> it was more of a hobby, <laughs> um, especially in Florida. So at that time, um, it was about 2000, it was, I think it was like mid 2012, um, the family started figuring everything out from a legal stance. Um, the estate was separated and my mom, came to me and said, we're working with Robert Rodriguez. He's a filmmaker and he wants to remake uh, Fire and Ice. So he was, so I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, okay, t tell me more. Like I want to, again, I, I knew grandpa as grandpa. I, I, of course I knew his catalog of art. I was around his art. I was in the museum with him, but I didn't, I never just thought of him as like a, a famous artist. I mean, people from high school go, why, 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 did, why did you never mention this? And I was like, because it just, mm -hmm. it was, it just wasn't a thing. So mm -hmm. when I went out to California, um, we were invited to California. Robert Rodriguez was exhibiting his artwork. Um, he had it also set up at like, I think it was at San Diego Comic Con and he was merchandising the artwork. And he, he made these like gorgeous full sublimation t-shirts and these like limited edition jaclays. And, and the way, like there was, a, there was a, a large group of people and I 
at that moment, my, my perspective shifted. I was like, wow, grandpa had a huge influence on everything that I love, um, that I strive to be and be involved in. Grandpa was like the founder of this in a way. And that like kind of blew my mind. And I'm like, oh my God, like, yes, like, yes, I want to be a part of this. Yes. I want to, I want to expand his, his and commercialize his legacy. Cause that's what he wanted. And then of course I want to have integrity and, and do it for the reason of, of just for the, for the sake of art, for the sake of education and for the sake of inspiration. So at that moment, that, that, that trip was a really big trip in my mind. And then we went back and we started doing some comic cons. Um, a, a few years later, my mom kind of stepped down because there wasn't, it wasn't very lucrative. Um, and I still had to keep a couple of jobs. I was doing social media managing, which is partly why we have such a huge social media following was that was like my passion for a long time was was social media and the importance of it. I mean, um, not to sidetrack too much, but I remember in my first job as and not my first job, but my first like big girl job as a post-production mm -hmm. coordinator, I was um, telling my boss, I'm like, please do social media. It's free. It's, it's the future. You have to do this. And he's like, that's a fad. And I'm like, <laughs> it's not a fad. And this was back in 2011. Sure. So, so that my, my, my understanding of social media and how I wanted to bring that and pair that with Frazetta was very important to me from, from day one. It wasn't until 2015, we really became like an online brand. Um, and that in, in part is because of my, my partner um, who I've been with, with for 12 years now, Joe, Joe Weber. Um, Joe has had a, I never understood what he did. Like he'd always be on the computer. He was one of those, one of those guys, just always on the computer. I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? But he, he ended up having like manufacturing connections and he loved designing things and, and, and he was really into, he's an artist himself. So he brought all the merchandising in-house. We started designing everything in-house, like from, from concept of a drawing to the end process. And, um, and he built our website and he's building a new website now because he says ours is not good enough. So we just, we just keep pushing and pushing and, and we want to, um, you know, just see how, how big we can make it for grandpa and mm. because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, just about 30 seconds left here. I was wondering uh, if oh. you could, uh, in those 30 seconds, yeah, if you could just talk about why your grandfather remains so popular because uh, almost every artist in the exhibit named your, your grandfather as uh, an influence on them. So in, in 30 seconds or less, can you uh, talk about his lasting influence? He was a one of one and there will never be another Frank Frazetta. He put his, truth into his art he put himself into his art and i think that rawness and that authenticity is why he will remain a legend terrific and what's your website frazettagirls.com all right uh, sarah thank you so much for coming on it's, as thank always you it's a pleasure so to much. talk to you Oh, and I can't wait to watch the next uh, Julie Bell and uh, oh my God, I, I can't everyone on the panel. Amazing. 